You're listening to the Inquisitive Rent Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Welcome back to the Inquisitive Rent Podcast. I'm Shah, your host. Today, we're going to delve into the fabulous and empirical world of the actor. I say empirical, but as we know, there's a method to the madness. Uh, See what I did there. Anyway, I'm so pleased to be speaking with Natalie Ford today, who is an artist in many areas. She's a professional acting coach living in Los Angeles. She's also a director and a fine art photographer. Today, we're going to focus on her work as an acting coach, how she helps actors come into their own, come into their own being, their own space, their own art, and how to express it to the highest level. And it's very interesting to find out the methods she uses, how she was trained. I've known Natalie for many, many years, so you may hear a bit of reminiscing Uh, But we hope that it's enjoyable to you. So I'm really pleased and happy to speak to her today. Welcome, Natalie Ford. Natalie, welcome. It's so nice to see you. Thank you so much for doing this today. And it's always lovely to see you. Thank you, Shaw. You too. It's been many years, so I'm really glad to reconnect with you. I know. We do go way, way, way back. So anyway, I want to start out by asking what drew you towards the acting profession? Because we're going to talk about your school, which is very important and doing really well. But I want to know about you and your journey to work in the acting profession as such. What drew you to it? Um, What originally drew me to it was my lack of um, courage, Hmm. personal lack of courage in my own life. And I was looking for a way to express myself and to learn how to express myself. And um, in 1988, I think it was, um, I got into an acting school that changed my life. And it taught me about communication and listening and courage and finding my own voice. And it changed my life for the rest of my life. It allowed me to express myself, um, maybe potentially originally through someone else's dialogue, but it allowed me to process my thoughts with enough courage to be able to speak up and, and express what I was feeling or thinking. Um, And it's, it's such a beautiful gift. And that's why I believe I went on to teach it because it, it illuminates you in many, many ways. The craft is very introspective. Um, And in some ways, the way that I teach it, it's very metaphysical. So it was a gift to, to myself originally Um, and it took me many years to find my own voice even after that. So I was always, even though I maybe didn't seem shy when I knew you, when I was younger, um, I, I was, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to communicate clearly and to communicate my emotional life clearly. Mm. And so that's what drew me originally, you know, as, as well as the community. And when you get into an acting school or an acting community, there's a certain sense of family that 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 happens immediately with the people that you're working with because it's such an intimate process and it's it's such a connectivity um and you find a family that you don't want to leave so that's so interesting you see I never knew that um and yes I suppose you know we we were so young back then uh I think we both had without going into details I think Our journey, how we started out, you and I, our friendship, we had some some blips too very early on. So I think that showed for both of us, actually, um, our journey, perhaps how we weren't fully fleshed out using acting terms a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, we were still learning about life, about Mm -hmm. how to relate to people, uh, about Mm -hmm. culture, about lots of things. Um, so yeah, we were very young. Um, and so although you say, you know, you, you may have appeared not shy, I can fully understand what you mean by that. Right. Kind of doing the evolution from, from child into adult and Mm -hmm. that transformation, um, is difficult for everyone. You and I were, we, if if it's okay, if I tell them, we worked at, uh, at an advertising agency that yep. was the hottest advertising agency in San Francisco. It was a really fun job. We were both very creative people. 
from the get-go and it was like mad men in the 80s and we were surrounded by incredible people and that job was a community as well that that community of creative funny amazing human beings and we were our own little family as well <clears throat> and we were young but i think that we were always drawn at least speaking for myself i was always drawn to creative intelligent funny people that that have courage that do something out of the ordinary it wasn't an ordinary type of situation and people that do that kind of work or any kind of creative work um, are stepping out of their comfort zone and they're taking risks you know they're not they're not doing the nine to five situation that that is as conservative as maybe some other choices mm. so yeah we and even at a young age we were young and creative right Absolutely. That's such a different perspective. I had never thought about it like that. So thank you for that. That's given me a whole new perspective. Because as you know, I've kept, <laughs> I'm a bit of a hoarder. I've kept so many things and I actually sent you a video. I found that agency stuff, a lot of stuff. And I sent you a video saying, oh my God, look at all this stuff. But yeah. there's, I think there's a reason why it's been with me all this time. There has to be. Right. We were a family. It, we were a family. And back then, um, it, we were, you know, we've just been through a big pandemic in our country, in our world, obviously, but, you know, we were experiencing AIDS. AIDS mm. had just come out. You know, we had, we had things that were happening to us in that generation mm. that were very, very scary and yeah. taxing as well. Absolutely. So, we yeah. were losing people left and right. Yep. Yeah, we were in San Francisco, which was the Mecca uh, besides New York, um, because it's huge LGBTQIA community. Yeah, we were really in there. So you're right. The AIDS epidemic was huge for us. That yeah, true. it was. Wow. Um, OK, so memory lane, really. Um, <laughs> Just for a it, second. Just for a yeah, second. Some of it will be happy memories and some not so much. And that is life. That is life. I want to ask you a little bit about acting and um, the different methods. So we know that there's that classical method, you know, using body and physicality and all that. And then you've got the Strasbourg method, you've got the um, Stanislavski, you've got Meisner. Actually, funnily enough, I was thinking because Meisner, it's actor to actor, you focus on the actor. I think my acting teacher was probably teaching us more Meisner when I was in high school. I was in the mm -hmm. acting club and we, I always got the best parts, myself and Chris Siller. Chris, if you're out there, we were a great duo in Chicago, you know, at high school in Chicago before I moved to California, of course. Um, mm. So what, what, what do you teach? Do you use all methods or your own? Is there a Natalie Ford method? <laughs> there is. I have developed a lot of different um, classifications of craft through mm -hmm. teaching many years. Now it's my 25th anniversary of my, wow. of my acting studio, which Congratulations. is Congratulations. That's Thank amazing. You. 25. I know it's crazy, but um, I, I respect all methods. I know them all. I integrate them depending on the client and what the client needs. Mm -hmm. So if you were to ask my definition of them, the Meisner method, yes, is very reactive actor to actor. It's great for younger actors when they're learning about themselves and they're learning to listen and they need to react to the other actor. Um, Stanislavski method is a little bit more my style only because I work in the competitive Hollywood industry so that it's incredibly imperative to be proactive. Mm -hmm. So the Stanislavski method or method acting mm -hmm. has been watered down over the years and many people have kind of ridiculed it and, and, and said that people take it to extremes. Um, the idea of method and becoming character is, can be taken to extremes because what I teach is, and it is Stanislavski, is that you do not step out outside of yourself to become a character, you are the character. So you don't, you don't leave yourself on the curb and become someone else when you step on set, okay? If you did that, you would become very fractured individual. I, I teach that you, you embody the character as you. Mm -hmm. In other words, you are um, all aspects of that character and of yourself in your work. So in order to do that, some, some highly method actors, say Jared Leto, Jake Gyllenhaal, some of these people that actually, and Adrian Brody, when he did The Pianist, 
first of all, they all win Oscars. So that says something, but you know, and some of them take it to extreme, but they actually put themselves potentially in a similar situation or circumstance to the character as the character evolves through the scene so that they embody the character. I don't know if that kind of went off on a tangent. I have a no, tendency to do that. However, okay. So method acting is very proactive. And I wouldn't say that I teach method acting. I teach a style that encourages proactive thinking, mm -hmm. going in prepared on the set or in your audition mm -hmm. so that you understand what you're doing ahead of time, but that you're trained well enough that you can pull out different ideas in your toolbox mm -hmm. on the spot. So it's, 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 as if you, it's as if you like have an instrument mm -hmm. and you're uh, learning your scales, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? And that way, when you get put up on stage and you're asked to do some jazz or some improv, you can do it. Mm. You're already prepared for the original song, but then when something changes or when you need to listen or react, because there are a lot of different elements that are coming at you on the actual set on the day, mm -hmm. then you can be alive in the scene. So you come in proactive and reactive at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm, you're armed with all of your ideas. You come in to, with the, with the, the foundation of what you want to show in that moment. And then you work, you collaborate with your fellow actor, with your director, with the, the showrunner, whoever it is that's, that's potentially collaborating to making the final product. Mm. Um, the craft technique that I teach is, is um, it's broken down into elements that are, that are structured in a way that it's the building block foundational craft situation that you can, um, um, there's, there's, um, outlines and different ways for you to understand it in a very structured manner because I am a Virgo, mm -hmm. but also because it is a very, um, in some ways, a very ethereal art and it can seem very over overwhelming unless you have a foundation and a structure that is clear and concise. Um, I'm a big believer in um, utilizing metaphysics in my craft mm -hmm. so that one of the first questions the actor has to ask themselves is who am I? Who am I as character? Mm -hmm. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking about? And of course, who is my audience? So who, what, when, where, why was Stanislavski's kind of original mm. building block foundational idea, right? I utilize that. And, and the, the who is one of the first questions you ask yourself as actor in order to become this character. So you start to do the work mm -hmm. And I work with actors of all levels. Mm -hmm. I work with beginning actors, celebrities. They all want to do this work. And they mm -hmm. always, always want to start again because it's a, it's a craft that you never stop growing into. And Jeff Goldblum, who's, who's ador adorable, he has one of my favorite quotes ever. And it is, I just figured out who I am and then I changed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what's happening is that we're evolving every day. We're changing mm -hmm. every day. So there's no end to the introspection and the, um, the vulnerability and the growth that you have as an individual, as an artist, as an actor. And that's what I love about the craft is that it's so metaphysical. It's so mm -hmm. introspective. The people that learn the craft um, and not for narcissistic ways, but for more of the elemental um, sharing a story mm -hmm. or um, connecting with their audience, mm -hmm. connecting mm -hmm. emotional life with their audience, telling the story of someone who has an arc, who learned something. These are the people that whose personal lives change dramatically as they learn the craft. I know that mine did. The more that I researched, you know, um, the emotional life that, that we tend to be drawn to. And we understand that we are more in control of our emotions than we actually maybe are aware of, right? And you start to examine your relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. So the who's the first element in creating your craft and, cre and going on your journey as actor and looking at the script, the who's, even the who's, that's, that's number one, that will change your life radically when you start to develop your inspiration and your I ideas into the work. Um, so I get so excited about it and I love mm. talking to people about it mm -hmm. because it is, it's transforming. It's beautiful. The, the screenwriter that wrote your character wrote that character for a reason mm -hmm. and they want to share that story for a reason. Mm -hmm. And you know what that reason is usually to touch someone's heart. 
to change someone's life, to mm -hmm. tell someone a story that makes them feel less alone and less vulnerable and less lonely. You know, as human beings, we all feel the same emotions, but, but under different circumstances. So when you understand that, that we're all connected, that all human beings feel pain and suffering and loneliness and joy and excitement and love. And when you understand that connection and you, that gives you the courage as artists to go forward and tell the story with a confidence and a, and a purpose. And that's where great acting comes into play because you have that confidence and you understand I'm telling the story for a reason and I'm allowing my body as instrument to become that human being that had this circumstance happen to them. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Great writing has an arc in the story. Mm -hmm. So the character is going to start out wanting something or having experienced something and then then find something out. They're going to they're going to figure something out. It's called the aha moment or mm -hmm. the arc in the scene is going to be when the character learns something and changes in some way. Mm -hmm. So if the if the story is well written and there most stories are all of the writing that's out now is phenomenal. Um, as actor, you look at your character arc and you say, what did my character want? What did my character figure out or find out? And what did that person learn mm -hmm. for the end of the either? And you can do that in scene work and it's fine. You can find them in scenes and then you can find them in entire stories. So, so the learning process of the human evolution is, 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 um, is prevalent in, 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 in film, TV, movies, even in the most simple stories, mm -hmm. this arc happens. Um, and that's the joy of it. And figuring out how you can tell your story in a unique way, in an honest way. Um, I've worked with many actors who have actually done um, um, true to life, uh, real people, not fictional. And they have to embody everything, the, the voice, the body, the, you know, the, the um, relationships, the childhood. So that's a journey into itself. Mm -hmm. And then you have, if you have a fictional character, you want to bring many different elements. And that's, both of them are difficult. Acting is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. People think, oh, I could do that. But it is actually a lifelong craft. And the actors that I know that have dedicated their lives to it work very hard on it. Um, I always say there's a, it's, a, it's a 10 year journey before you make it overnight, you become an overnight success, right? Um, and it truly is. And it, and it truly takes a lot, a lot of um, perseverance. Um, but, but to become a fictional character, you are able to potentially sprinkle in a lot more unique ideas that maybe come from you, as opposed to mm -hmm. becoming this person that's already been alive or is alive today. Yes. Um, so, so the who, even just starting with the who are you, is mm -hmm. such a beautiful journey. If everybody can see my cat. Oh, beautiful. I she's, know. She's a sweetheart. I do love Lovely. my cat. Mm. She always joins my classes. She, she mm. likes to listen in. Um, so I, you know, and the, and the beautiful thing about the who's is that, um, you can, you can, um, you can bring yourself into every character, but you can also decide, um, who am I talking to and, and what is the, re and, and, and one thing that, that evolves from that is that we are all different people depending on who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. So if you have a character who's in one scene speaking to his father, and then the next scene speaking to their lover, mm -hmm. you have a whole different ball to bounce for lack of a better, I don't know where oh, that came from, right. the ball to bounce, yeah. but there's a whole different idea. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at human nature and how are we presenting ourselves, depending on who we talk to, right? All of the elements that you achieve through your acting process can be translated and used in your personal life and make you a better person and make your relationships better and make you feel stronger emotionally. Because mm. once you start to delve into the emotional life, so if you, if you look at who am I, and then you think about what am I feeling, mm -hmm. right? What am I feeling? That's, um, and it's not a science, it's an art. So mm -hmm. nothing's more important than anything else, in my opinion, in this mm -hmm. craft, right? It, it's all important. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about how I'm feeling and you start to broaden your emotional scope, 
you as a human being? How am I feeling? You start with you. How am I feeling? How do I feel when I wake up in the morning? How do I feel 99% of my day, right? So we all have emotional cores that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the basic emotions, which could be love, could be one, but you have anger, Mm -hmm. fear, sadness, happiness, maybe jealousy was brought up by one of my students the other, the other afternoon. So we have, and, and this is a conversation that we, that I have with my students. And again, it's an art. So no ideas are wrong. Right. No emotions are wrong, right? right. Um, we, we start to develop our emotional palate, mm-hmm. but the basic core emotions that every human being has, um, if you identify them mm-hmm. as you, as Shaw, as Natalie, mm-hmm. you start to understand how you can translate them into your work as an actor. Mm-hmm. So the introspection of how am I feeling? So going beyond who am I? And then how mm-hmm. am I feeling? How am I feeling as me? And am I responsible for that feeling? Mm. Can I control that feeling? I don't know. That's a question for all of us, right? Can we? And what creates our feelings? Does the circumstance create our feelings? You know, Mm. are are we creating our circumstance because we feel a certain way? So example of anger, which is a propellant, you know, am I creating this fist fight because I'm so angry all the time? I don't know. Did I just create? So there's a, there's a cycle. Mm -hmm. But going beyond, going beyond the basics is what I teach for my actors that are willing to do the work. Mm-hmm. And that is to go beyond the basic core foundational emotion that mm-hmm. has an energy to it. And what is that, uh, what is that emotion radiate out in smaller ways? You know, what, what are the intricate specific emotions? Right. So for example, if you're looking at happiness, so from that you might have um, surprise, excitement, mm-hmm. you know, all different kinds of emotions that stem from that one core based foundational emotion. Oh. So as an actor, you have to be a, um, you have to be a, a, a courageous, specific expression of emotion, mm. a very specific explained. emotion. Beautifully explained, my friend. I love this work. So, 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 you know, so, but when you, but when I ask a client, say potentially when they first start working with me, like, how are you feeling? How do you feel? Mm -hmm. And, and they'll judge themselves. Well, I'm sad or I'm scared, or, you know, there's a war now and we're in war and, you know, you know, the pervasive feeling right now for all of us is potentially fear, nervousness, you know, uncertainty. Um, And, and it is a, it is a, uh, it, it is a little bit more difficult for actors that are, not speaking English as their first language, mm. because mm-hmm. there's a very specific semantics, right? Mm-hmm. So if I ask you, what's the difference between frustration and impatience? Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a semantical issue, right. but there is a difference. So if I'm working with an actor to try to, to expand their emotional palette mm-hmm. so that when they get on set, they won't just be hitting the basics. Mm-hmm. They'll be a genius actor is one that understands the very intricacies and the specifics of these core basics Mm -hmm. so that they can show a full range. It's like Mm -hmm. icing on the cake, right? So they've already picked what's kind of happening to the actor in that circumstance. And how does that make that actor character feel? But, oh, this is such a nice little sprinkling of this, 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 and this, and this, and this. But the only way to do that, and it's a lifelong journey, is to sit with your emotions, identify Mm -hmm. them, feel them, Mm -hmm. honestly, feel Mm -hmm. them, and then present them to camera. Right. The beauty of the camera is the camera catches everything. It, okay. The camera doesn't lie. So that's the gift and the curse of the camera for mm-hmm. film and TV actors. Because if you are not feeling something, mm-hmm. if you're not thinking something or doing something, the camera's gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna, you look vacant. You're not gonna be as present. Right. You're still gonna be there, but you may potentially, the editor may go to something else that's more interesting. Mm. So, but the audience sees that the audience will see that. I see that I do. I see, I don't see that very often, Mm -hmm. but I do see because it's usually on the editing room floor Mm -hmm. or cut out, but usually the actor that's alive, the entire scene, who's either thinking something, Mm -hmm. feeling something or doing something Mm -hmm. is the one that's catching the eye of the, of the audience as one that's, that's alive. Even Mm -hmm. when the other character has dialogue, if you're thinking, there's a great documentary about Humphrey Bogart that I showed my class a, a, a while ago. And he was one of the first um, celebrated thinkers 
in American mm -hmm. cinema. Mm -hmm. And they could hold the screen, the, the camera on him mm -hmm. for, for five, 10 seconds and, and watch him think. And I'll tell you, he was thinking specific thoughts. Mm -hmm. It wasn't random. He went in prepared. He knew what he was thinking. Right. Right. It's so it's a very prep. It's a preparation meets mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if the camera's on you for a, for a moment before or a button, you need to be either thinking, doing, or feeling right. those three elements. Excellent. But, to... Yeah, I just want to quickly ask you, though, saying that and um, letting the viewers, because that's a lot to ingest. It's, you're so passionate about your work. Uh, but I, I want to ask you about a quote, because you're talking about thinking, feeling. Charlie Chaplin said, we think too much, we feel too little. Yes, I love that quote. In fact, mm. I had that on my business card for a, while, a long right. time. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that quote. And I, and I agree. And I think that um, it's got to be a balance okay. of the right. three, right? You, you, as a human being, you're always thinking or feeling or mm. doing something. And I heard to my, to my, it was to my um, disgust, some teachers are teaching these actors to not move. There was some, there was like some wow. kind of fad or something that was going around in Hollywood. And they were telling the actor not to move and to just sit you know, straight. And I couldn't believe it. I thought that's the worst acting advice you could ever give anyone. You have to be alive. You have a three quarter shot. Like you and I have three quarter shots mm -hmm. right now. There's a lot of room to mm -hmm. move and to be and to create, right? And then they come up to close up. And of course they have the master in the beginning, right. but there's a lot of room to be alive. And, you know, there's so many books on philosophy mm. and metaphysical mm. research and finding yourself. And I think as, as I have done my explorations into that thought process, at the, every day is different. And I'm always attracted to different thoughts right. and different energies on that subject because it's such a, a ethereal subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've always seen philosophy as a real thinking process you know centuries ago people would sit in ca cafes in Paris or wherever and just ponder life ponder existence and that's some of where our greatest poetry has come from or our greatest writings have come from just people pondering life and I suppose the actor brings those ponderings the screenwriters ponderings to life that's what right. the actor does um, Marlon Brando actually said a quote. I like this. An actor is at most a poet and at least an entertainer. I thought that was interesting coming from a method actor. Beautiful. What, what are your thoughts about that? That's beautiful. Um, in my opinion, what he's saying is that if the actor has depth and thought in the work, they bring poetry. Mm. If they show up if they at least show up and they know their lines and they're telling the story, they will entertain you. Mm -hmm. That's the first feeling I got from that quote. I haven't heard that quote before, but I love it. Mm -hmm. It's very true. The deeper, and that's why I teach depth work mm -hmm. into the craft because mm -hmm. you can superficially create the, the work. You can show up and, mm -hmm. and get through the day and, and create the, the, what, what's expected and, and entertain people. But if you really want to show the emotional, psychological journey of the character, it takes a little more thought, a little more heart, a lot more work. Excellent stuff. Now, I wanted to ask you, have you ever had to fly above anything? Hmm, in what way? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. Any <laughs> It's the inquisitive Wren. So the Wren, okay. I'll just give you a quick background about the Wren. The Wren was a little tiny bird and it was seen, as, it was underestimated in life. And it, this is folklore, but it was known to outwit the eagle, which is oh, huge, wow. huge in wow. the bird realm. And apparently it was just underestimated. People thought it wouldn't survive. And here's this little Wren. I use it as a metaphor for life for me. That's it. why I call the podcast The Inquisitive Wren because I've always asked loads of questions. But <laughs> I like the idea of the Wren, this tiny little bird that just flies above everything. Wow. It can sense and feel danger or, you know, trepidation or caution. 
but it just flies above it. So in, in life, have you ever had to fly above in anything you want to share? Every day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. I think every day we do, right? Um, it's a competitive world. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I'm in a competitive industry. And now in um, my clients are in a competitive industry mm-hmm. every day. We have to um, not think about people that may be smarter or prettier or richer or more successful than we are. Mm-hmm. And as an artist, there's no way to um, art, create if you are not flying above all of it. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, uh, letting the winds of God carry you. Because there, if you were to think about the people and, and not in an evil way or not in, 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 in a predatory way, but there yeah. are yeah. people around us all the time that are um, maybe potentially doing better or um, making, that would make us feel like we're not enough. And um, so every day we have to wake up and understand that we are enough, that we are strong enough, that we're wise enough, that we have something to share. We have our own story to tell. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that I do in my classes and on my privates, especially before a client might have a director meeting or a big meeting, Mm-hmm. is we do an affirmation exercise mm-hmm. and Excellent. I am, I am ready. I am strong. I am courageous. Mm-hmm. I am talented. I am flexible. I am prepared. And this is, you know, can go on for a couple minutes so that the client and myself, I, I get, I get beautiful energy from it too. We start to radiate, we start to vibrate mm-hmm. that, that shows through our work and through our, our speech and it's everything. So uh, I love that Ren story. I think we're all Wrens mm-hmm. every day. <laughs> yeah, right? that's really helpful. I think that will resonate with many people listening to this right now. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, it kind of takes me to your, um, uh, with the <laughs> pandemic, it's taken people to a different uh, space and place where we've been forced to work in a different way. And I just wonder if, you know, people like Netflix, their profits have exploded during the pandemic. And they've gone into other areas, you know, they put out lots of calls for work from people, they're soliciting scripts, and they're really, really getting out there. And I think I'm wondering from you, have you found a difference in both what's available to the actor? And what's perhaps available working behind the scenes a bit. Any thoughts on that? Because you're Um, right in the thick of it. You're in Hollywood, so. Yeah, there's a lot going on um, in this arena. So, and in a lot of ways, I think it's a positive change to go into Zoom uh, auditions, to on-tape auditions. Um, I was in casting for 10 years, so. Mm we would have people, human beings have to drive all over city from Burbank to Venice to wherever, um, audition after audition, park their car, come out, get into a waiting room, sit and wait to go into the audition in which we recorded them in the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it it limited the amount of people we could see because you only had a certain amount of time in the day. Mm -hmm. So now what's happening is actors are putting themselves on tape Mm -hmm. at, at home. And all of my clients have a, their own little home set up. It's not a professional studio, but it's nice enough. It's good enough and it's professional enough. It's a game so that they get into the, to the, the casting director's mm-hmm. view as they're going to be on screen. So it's very good for them. The casting director doesn't have to deal with a lot of different energies coming in and out. They can view tapes at their leisure and faster. So there's more opportunity for more actors to get into the the view of the casting directors for a particular project. Um, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's a phenomenal opportunity for actors right now. Actors have never had as much an opportunity as they do right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Now the production side is a little different. The casting element is, is, I think, quite wonderful. So again, they just put themselves on tape. It goes to the casting director. The casting director sees them as on tape, which is how they're going to end up anyway on film and TV, right? So that's a plus. Um, and, And early on, the client gets a sense of how to put an audition on tape themselves. They see themselves on tape. So after my classes, I send them a wee transfer and they see their work. 
it's beautiful. It's amazing. We never got this in the eighties or nineties or even in the two thousands. Right. Yeah. So, but then productions have been hit. Obviously productions are, are suffering because they, they, they're on skeleton crews and they don't, they're not allowing, they are now, I think, because we're just opening up again, but for many years, they, we, we weren't allowed to have large, you know, productions, productions were shut down if someone got COVID and there was a lot of quarantine and, and, and things like that. So the actors suffered production wise. However, the production is at full force. They, I mean, even with the co- even with the restrictions, mm. because you're right, because people are craving content, mm-hmm. you know, people that have been quarantined or, you know, people, there's so many incredible television um, limited series right now, Netflix, Amazon, all of the, all of the channels, uh, HBO. And then we had mm-hmm. Apple TV just, just mm-hmm. evolved. All of these different elements are creating incredible content. So the work for actors has never been as ripe and as amazing as, and as accessible from actors all over the world as it is now. Mm-hmm. I have actors in Australia and London and, and people that are able to, to submit yeah. now through Zoom. They could have never done that before ever. So I think in that way, as, as horrifying as, as this COVID situation Mm -hmm. has been Mm -hmm. for, for the acting art, it has transformed casting completely. And I don't know that it will go back at this point. I would say that casting directors are not going to want to hold in session auditions unless it's a, it's a final product, like a chemistry read or a director Mm -hmm. meeting. At this point, all of the, the pre-reads and even the, the kind of maybe, maybe 10 or, or 12 like final decisions are still going to be coming in through tape, self-tape. And I think it's very convenient for everybody. Podcasting can be a minefield when you're first starting out. So it was really important that I find the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Follow the link in the show notes to let Buzzsprout know that I sent you, and you'll get a free Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan. You also support the show. Now, back to the show. So also, you know, this is the thing about live acting classes is that as actor, you can hide on stage Mm. in a way that you can't hide on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I'm teaching someone and we have a scene and they put a scene up and we're taping it and I put the pin them, it's just them. um, We see everything for better or worse, right? That's why it takes great courage to act. Mm. And on camera, on Zoom, they have the opportunity to watch themselves back. So I don't know that I'll go back to teaching live classes. Mm -hmm. First of all, most of my clients are from all over the world. So Mm -hmm. it would be, Mm -hmm. it would be nearly impossible, Mm -hmm. but even my LA based clientele, I I feel like we get so much more work done one-on-one on on camera than we do in person. Fantastic. This is such good news. It is, it is, it is, you know, it's been a real, you know, I think everybody was in, I I hope to, I hope and pray that we are evolving out of this pandemic Mm -hmm. and people are starting to feel the freedom and that Broadway can come back to life and, and, you know, theaters coming back. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that the theater actors have suffered tremendously, but for film and TV actors, it's actually been quite convenient. That's, this is fantastic news. How does the actor, uh, and I'm asking this question because early in my career as a therapist, a lot of actors I saw came to me for confidence issues. Now, a few of them, because I did hypnotherapy, would come to me for reflux. You know, they would throw up before they hit the stage, um, you know, and or it was the confidence to actually get out there to put themselves forward. So what do your, because every, you know, this doesn't affect every actor, but how does an actor, how would you suggest they, or does it differ for each person? So I think it differs also between live stage performance and on camera performance, Mm -hmm. you know, the butterflies that someone feels. Uh, I know actors that have, and I think we've all experienced 
out of body, you know, they have out of body experiences. They get so afraid that they, they check out and they, it's like, go ahead. They're, they're kind of go into a blackness. They don't really know what they're doing. They're so terrified. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, I have to say that this sounds cheesy, but training is everything. The more prepared you are mm. and the more confident you are in your choices, the more work you've done, the more excited you are and confident you are about sharing this character in the story. Right. I think the fear comes when you start to doubt yourself. And I think everybody, we all doubt ourselves all the time, but when, when you haven't actually done the work that you kind of maybe intuitively knew that you wanted to do before you hit the stage, that's when you're like panic potentially. Mm -hmm. Think about it as music. You know, if you know your song and you're ready to get up and sing it there, you will have the butterflies and it'll be excitement. There's no question. That's what propels you. And that's why we love the art. Right. But you're, you can't wait to share it. No, that should be the same with acting. Excellent. If you're prepared well enough and you want to get up and sing your song and share your story of the character and the, the, the sickness shouldn't be there. It should be, you should still be excited, but you can, you know, so I would say if an actor is getting really sick, I would say, let's sit down and let's go over something that you may feel like you're missing mm -hmm. from this character. Mm -hmm. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid? Maybe you didn't hit or investigate deeply enough. And, and push them through that, help them understand that, and then get them excited to tell the story. The other thing that you can do, and I, I know I just talked about creating character as you, is it, it helps the actor or any artist to understand that it's not about them. Mm. This is not about you. It's about the character and you're telling the story of this human being's struggles. So try to not think about it as you, even though it is you, which is kind of, kind of confusing, but, but think about it as your, your opportunity and your obligation to tell this human story go and they'll go. So it's, it's about a lot of different elements that could be potentially making that stage fright, like, like upsetting. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of different ways that you can, you can kind of delve into it, mm -hmm. but um it's, it's a, it's a real, it's a real thing. I mean, you know, actors put themselves, it's a very difficult art. They put themselves up for grabs to critics, to the public eye, you know, even something as simple as having an Instagram account, if you're a famous actor is, is risky, you know, um, it, it's, it's, you know, you're, it's a vulnerable place to be putting yourself up there in the public eye. And that's what they're doing every day of their lives. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I like what you were saying earlier in the interview about the craft itself. It is a craft, just like a, a worksman, a woodman, you know, a, a locksmith, a, a painter, you know, somebody who builds homes. This is a craft that has to be worked on all the time. It's not as though you learn it and that's it. Right. Um, yeah. Just like my profession, I'm still on courses. I have supervision, all that stuff. It's a craft. It's something you, that's why it's called for me a practice. It's a practice. And like my yoga practice and acting, right. I think is similar. It's something you, the more you do, you continue to do. You have to switch things up and change. Does that resonate at all? Do people sometimes going into different roles, comedies, and they want to they want to yeah, and the other thing, yeah. the other thing is I always tell my clients, if you don't love people, don't become an actor oh. because you have to love people. Mm. You have to not only love yourself, you have to love your character. You have to love your fellow actors. Mm -hmm. You have to forgive people constantly. Everybody's in a different mind space. There's a lot of ego in the business. Mm. There's your, your, it's a collaborative art. There's no way around it. You know, unless you're doing a monologue in your bathroom with your camera it, as you know, there, there is, it's a collaborative art. Everybody right. has a vision and it's a communicative art. So you have to be able to communicate well mm -hmm. and you have to be able to stand up for your character and your decisions and your choices. So I feel like that's, it's, um, and I totally forgot what your question <laughs> It's okay. I trust, your <laughs> I trust whatever you're saying is related. <laughs> I trust the process. <laughs> oh, the crap. So, you know, I think it's just, it's, a, it's an evolving art because we're always evolving. Yeah. Our are. character evolves in the, the limited space of our scene or our script or movie, right? In, in huge ways, sometimes, sometimes in more intricate, small ways. 
but we all evolve as human beings and we all change as human beings. And also as actor, the fun thing is that yes, you're gonna get all different kinds of roles potentially, unless you, unless you don't want to do a lot of different things. You wanna stay on one, one train the whole way through your mm -hmm. career. But I always say like steer your own ship, you know, pick different characters that feel interesting to you when you get your, uh, when you get your auditions, you know, add some different elements of character so that you're always on a journey. Mm. You're always discovering different things about yourself uh, as character. So Excellent. absolutely. Good. So I wanna ask you, if you could live in any decade, oh. any decade, past, present, future, what would it be? Wow, that's an interesting question. You know, um, I was speaking to my mother about what we've been through in this decade, at least this, this, our generation and um, the fear that we've had. And looking back at before or around the time that I was born in the sixties, mm -hmm. they had the Vietnam war, they had the assassination of, of Kennedy. They had so many different like traumatic Martin Luther King, all these different people that were, um, you know, assassinated and all this different uh, energy and, and, I, I think about the civil unrest and I think, you know, I love the sixties. Um, we grew up, I was born in the sixties. So, so was raised in the seventies and eighties, of course. And um, I, I honestly don't know because I, I feel like all of these different decades have, have so many different elements to mm -hmm. them. If I were going to pick music or art, um, hmm, I know, know what I you're going to say. Oh, well, I, we, I thought you were going to say the 70s. Well, I do. I, the 70s were interesting, music. right? Okay. The music Wait. in the 70s was interesting, right? We had some great, great bands. We really did. There's music, music and poetry. I also, I also uh, like was so attracted to the, to the New Yorker and the, you know, the Dorothy New Parker. York. What if we, what yes. if we were... What if we were brought up then when you could sit around and then you were speaking earlier about philosophy and sitting and having a cup of coffee mm -hmm. in Paris and, and easier times, maybe more simple times, mm -hmm. right? Where we weren't come bombarded with social media, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I remember that though, New York, the New Yorker, you always liked the New York. Actually, you gave me, I don't know if you remember, you gave me a p little pen that said the New Yorker. Yeah, I worked for the New Yorker for four years. Ah, I still have it. I still have the, that. The, the New Yorker magazine. Yeah, it was. Yeah. You know, my my the other loves of my life, and they all come together are photography and poetry, absolutely, and literature, and they all work together for for the for for the sake of storytelling, and um, the New Yorker magazine is one of my is one of the best magazines in the world, of course, and one of my all time favorite magazines. Truman Capote started there. Everyone. He sure did. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I still have that New Yorker pen. It's literally That's so sweet. It's just in a, a box over there. Yeah. Uh, not box, a cabinet. Um, do you know, you know, I have to tell you that I didn't know if you remember Merritt Malloy. Merritt Malloy. Yes. The poet. The poet. Merritt Malloy. I have to say there's one thing about social media. So I reached out to her on Facebook. Oh, my and God. I produce these poetry gatherings with my community here in LA and we every few months we get together and read poetry and and I invited her and she might be coming to the next one you should probably fly over and meet her come stay oh with me I would love to she wrote to me I wrote to her she wrote back have come meet her you have to come and meet her and we'll have you know because she is getting older she is she is she's indeed. she was she was uh, one of our inspirations she right? was our inspiration definitely merit my lord beautiful beautiful poet what a beautiful yeah, woman definitely so heartfelt she inspired my own poetry yeah. um oh my goodness uh, that you're meeting her oh my when when you're gonna well, come we'll talk about it we, we'll talk about it later we'll, ta we'll talk about it off stage off camera <laughs> um what makes your heart sing? Music. Mm -hmm. music. Yeah, you've always loved music. Music, and, and, I, and, I, and I use music in my, in my teaching and, and actors should use, use music as well. Um, if you're trying to, to create a state of being, whether it be melancholy or frenetic energy or uh, sophistication mm -hmm. or, you know, the music that your character listens to is a vibration. Okay, there's so many elements of character 
and one of the vibrations is music. And so when you start to understand the power that music has mm -hmm. over the human body and spirit and, and vibration, you appreciate it even more. So that being said, I am specific about what I listen to. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to certain music that kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. makes me crazy, Same. obviously. Mm -hmm. So very picky. I, I can't do like hard rock or mm -hmm. punk rock. Or, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's too, too, too radical for me. However, if I were working with an actor that was supposed to, you know, be a young mm -hmm. rock and roll kid, that's what we'd be listening to. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. And it, and it, and it, it, it's a, it's a gift. I love musicians. I've always loved music. Mm. Now, um, I want to go back to your school and how people, I mean, I know you are specific because you can only help a certain amount of people at a certain amount of time. So if someone needed, sorry guys about my green screen, it's just, it's a bit odd. It looks like a ghost is coming in at times. But anyway, You're possessed. Um, I'm possessed. It's a, it's I am a, indeed. It's your good uh, vibration. It's your aura. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, you know, remember we used to say that? Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask. So if it, somebody wanted to, you know, have some, they were just going into acting. And I, I, I actually want to tell you my story about Carrie Fisher, actually. But I will tell you in a minute. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, when I was an extra in, in L.A. I think you were still uh, in Northern California. I just moved yeah. to L.A. But anyway, I wanted to ask if somebody wanted to come to you to join the school and to get some training, how would they go about it? Do they audition for you? How did they go about it? So what I do is um, I have the website. They can either like kind of register through the website or um, just look me up. It's And then um, I do interview people. I do that because I think it's good for everyone. And we do a little FaceTime. Hello. Um, I talk about how I teach and see if it resonates with them. I see what their energy is like. Um, I have students of all different levels. So I want to make sure that it's fair for everyone, depending on where they play, what class I place them in so that they're all kind of in, in simpatico. Um, and energy is really important to me. That's why, you know, you and I are friends is because mm -hmm. we're so in tune yeah. with energy and it's everything in acting. And so my students are guaranteed when they're in the class that they're safe from bad energy, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So if everybody that's in the class, they're supportive, they're competitive, but they're, but they're, they're smart and they're working actors. Mm -hmm. Everybody signs an NDA before they get into class, mm -hmm. meaning that they cannot share what's been talked about in class. We talk about intimate things, emotions are intimate. Mm -hmm. And then once they pass, pass or, or they like me and I like them and they decide to come on, then they just join the class on Zoom. It's pretty easy. I send the link out, you know, it's, it's, abs it's like the time change can be tricky for some mm -hmm. of the classes, but um, cause I do have London and Australia, which are completely different time zones, but we make it work, you know, and I have one class, um, Tuesday morning, LA time and Australians get up at five in the morning, their time the next day to, to join it. Um, they're dedicated and they, they love the work and they love the community. So, um, I keep, I, I do keep a pretty heavy eye on who I allow into the class for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got an eclectic group, actually. You've got, as you said at the top of the interview, you've got professional actors who, and some very famous, very well-known celebrities. And then you've got people just starting out, just getting out there. So it, it, it's good to mix it up, isn't it? I would think because you've Yeah, got I think it's really important to feel safe. Hmm. Um, I think that when an actor joins a Zoom class, they need to feel like they can be themselves and make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to be a beginner if you're if you're working, if you're if you're if you're earnest and if you're showing up and you want to do the craft. If it's if you're not like just looking to be kind of having fun in my class, I, I'm I hate to say it, but I'm a professional coach. Like I so I don't have time for people that just want mm -hmm. to have fun. <laughs> they want, I want them to succeed in it. You know, I, I make sure my act, the people that work with me work and get, you know, make their dreams come true. So if you're in the class, I want you to be a serious actor, not to say that we're not going to have fun, but it, the people that are in the class already, they're there because they have, they have sacrificed a lot and given up a lot to make this their profession. So they want to be surrounded by people of the same mindset. So 
Um, yeah, the, the celebrity actors that I work with are more for performance prep. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily taking the class, although they'll come in. I have the great thing about the class I have to say is that I have professionals come in, industry professionals come in and view the scenes and give the actors feedback. Um, I just had John Patrick Shanley, who's one of the most all-time iconic director, screenwriters, mm -hmm. playwrights come to my class and he watched the scenes and he gave them insightful uh, feedback and everybody was over the moon. I mean, needless to say, it was a big coup. It was like my, my gift for Amazing. my 25th anniversary. It was incredible. He's an incredible human being. So prolific, so thoughtful, mm -hmm. watch the scenes with such emotional investment, you know, and um, I, I, I challenge my actors to be ready for professional industry guests like that, right? So, and these are friends of mine. So I'm not a, I'm not a like showcase mm -hmm. class. In other words, they, there are showcase classes where you can sign up and have people just come and watch you. But these are actual friends of mine. Mm -hmm. So I want the quality to be great because it, 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 you know, it shines on me how the actors present their material. So the showcase is, is, is different than a personal guest coming to a class. It's more mm -hmm. intimate. They trust me. They trust the actors that they're going to see. Mm. Um, so I've had casting directors and managers and agents come to the class and directors. I had Wally Pfister come, who is a cinema like um, Oscar winning cinematographer with Chris Nolan. Um, he did all the Batman movies. So sometimes it's great to have not just directors and writers, but cinematographers come in mm. because they can the actors can ask questions about camera, eye line, mm -hmm. continuity, physicality. Is it okay with this? Can you share a story about that? So having different elements mm -hmm. of, of industry professionals come in and talk to the actors is a big coup as well. So that's really fun. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiverin.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics being discussed. And if you can contribute, please let us know so you can be a guest on the show. Now, back to the show. It, it is, is really indeed. fun. Yes, and yeah. they, they get a full experience of that. Something they yeah. wouldn't normally get if they're not getting parts, they're not on set, they're not. So this is fantastic. Right, yeah, thank you. And you know, it's through Zoom because I would never get John Patrick Shanley unless he were sitting, he literally is on zoom. Mm. He, you know, I'd have to fly him to LA, you know, set it, put it, you know, mm. so these, these guests can, can join the class from all over the world. And that makes it easier for everybody as well. So that's been great. It's been great. Fantastic. And 25 years. I mean, congratulations. Thank You're you. doing something right here. Uh, but, you know, just going back a little bit about that, you you started out as an actor pretty much. Well, you know, learning the craft. Right. And then I just I forgot to ask you a bit about what made you start to teach. Well, so it's a fun journey. I uh, I started in San Francisco. I studied with a woman by the name of Jean Shelton and kudos to the actors theater there in yeah. San Francisco. She was phenomenal. She well, taught me a lot. I know of, that name. I know she's that amazing. Name. Okay. And her son, Matt was my first acting teacher. Wow. And she, she studied with Uta Hagen. So she was, she was training us the Stanislavski mm -hmm. Uta Hagen technique. Um, and then I went to the um, American Conservatory Theater to get, and I got more stage, more kind of musical theater stage training there. And then I went to New York um, for a few years, mm -hmm. came back and I started studying with a woman by the name of Elizabeth Kemp. And I don't know if you know who she is. She's, she's well known because Bradley Cooper brought, thanked her at the Oscars. She's an incredible acting teacher, Elizabeth Kemp. Okay. She's, she's passed away now. God rest mm -hmm. her. She was an incredible teacher, mentor mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And I studied with her. Well, when I came back to San Francisco after being in New York, I was pursuing performing. Mm -hmm. And um, I I met some incredible human beings in one of my first experiences on set. It was, I, I did a couple different things, but um, I met Philip Seymour Hoffman in 1994. It was his first role. He was just out of NYU. Um, and he was doing um, When a Man Loves a Woman. Um, and I also met George Lucas, or I, I was working with George and, and, he propelled me into meeting this casting director by the name of Nancy Hayes, who was also in San Francisco and she's still there. And San Francisco has like two casting directors. 
and Nancy Hayes set me up into going into production. So basically what happened was I, I started to go from the idea of being a performer mm -hmm. into meeting these incredibly prolific actors and getting mm -hmm. to know them and getting to know their style. And I was on set on a John Carpenter movie. One of the girls that was one of the actors wanted my help crying. She said, I have to cry in this scene. And I wasn't teaching yet, but I had told her about my experience and so forth. And she said, will you help me on this scene? So I went into her trailer and we, I, I prepped her for this scene in which she had to cry. It's very difficult to cry on cue. And you know, also back then we didn't have cry sticks or any, we didn't have any of that. It was like, we had to really do it. So I was coaching her and I thought, this is fun. This is it. I, I like this. I really like this. Well, I moved to San Francisco, I moved to LA shortly after that experience. And I had no money and I had to work. So I got a job for a manager by the name of J. Michael Bloom. And he was working with a young actor, Alec Baldwin at the time and some other major actors. And um, I got the full experience of the business side of acting from him. And then I got into cat. I'm like, I don't wanna be in the business of management. I wanna be something creative and I'm an actor. I love acting, I love the craft. So I got into casting. And I started working with some incredible casting directors. So meanwhile, all of my creative visions and all of my performing were, were put on the side burner for 10 years. I wasn't acting, I wasn't performing, but I was around actors. I was in, in investigating the business side of acting. And um, I was called in to teach a showcase. And um, because I was, on a, I was on a show, I was casting a show and my creative juices came back to life. I started to teach the showcase because they invite showcase for showcases. They invite casting directors in to watch the actors and so forth. And the woman that was running the showcase was in Burbank. She said, you know, the students loved your class. They loved you. You're a great teacher. Why are you not doing this? So she gave me my first class in her acting studio. She had an act, her own acting studio called AIA. God bless you, Katie. She gave me my first class. And she let me teach a class there. And it was my first experience of taking all the knowledge that I'd had from, from the different aspects. Mm. And keep in mind, I was still really close with Philip. I was around these people that were incredible actors. Mm. I was understanding craft in a way that I had never before. Mm -hmm. Because when you're learning in a classroom and you're, and you're able to like take everything um, that's, that's, that's emotional and, and turn it into um, proactive work, um, to be around these people and actually watch them do it is, is such a, such an art. It's such a gift. Um, so I evolved from casting, which I kept on doing for many years, uh, until I, I, I didn't need to do it anymore. And I was getting clients. I, I got a couple of celebrity clients that were able to sustain me financially mm -hmm. and casting became too much. I couldn't do both. I just, there was no way I could do both. And so I stepped away from casting and I still miss casting. I still miss the opportunity to see actors come in. And, but the, the frustrating thing about casting was that I was there and I would be taping them and reading with them, but I couldn't coach them. So actors would come in and they would be almost really great, but there would be something wrong with what they were doing. And I knew what it was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, maybe you should, I wanted to help them, you know? They, some people would have management, but they didn't know how to act. Mm -hmm. Some people mm -hmm. would, would come in, but they, they just had a couple of things wrong. And I knew that if I coach them and give them ideas, mm -hmm. they would have booked the part, but you can't do that as a casting director. Mm -hmm. There's no way you cannot coach them. Mm -hmm. um, at a certain level, you can give them ideas, but when it's just pre-reads and you've got one after another, mm -hmm. there's just no way to get into that intimacy with the actor. So I started my own studio in 1997 and I opened up two different studios, one in, in Sherman Oaks and one here in Santa Monica. And um, I've never looked back. I've loved it every second of it. And it's, it's been a rough road. You know, there's been times it's like, oh, why am I doing this? It's a lot of work. And, you know, you have to deal with a lot of personalities and it's a, it's a very tough art. You know, it's a tough business. Mm -hmm. But um so that's kind of the idea of the story of how I transitioned from performer to teacher, you know, and the, the, the other thing I was doing back when I was casting is I was directing, I directed a bunch of plays. I created a one act festival 
um, in 2000 and 2001. And um, it was a huge deal. We had Annette Benning and Catherine O'Hara. And on the honorary committee list, we had David O. Russell and Spike Jones. And oh. um, it was an incredible opportunity. Um, Sophia Coppola, we had, a, we had a bunch of actors. And my idea was to have a one act stage festival where I would ask my writer friends to write a one act and my director friends to direct it and then bring in celebrities to perform it. But I, would, I wanted to mix the well-known with the just emerging mm -hmm. artists. So it was a combination of celebrity and emerging artists. Mm -hmm. And then we attached the charity Cure Autism Now to it. And it was a huge deal. It was at the Cannon Theater for two years in a row. It raised a couple hundred thousand dollars for the charity. And it was an incredible opportunity for the young actors in my class mm -hmm. to work with major directors and major uh, actors. And, it was, it was a lot of workshop and I did it for two years and I was like, okay, I'm going to not do, um, and you know, stage in LA is very different than stage in New York. It was a very, it was a lot of work. Um, but I love directing. So looking forward, I've been looking at directing. Um, and now everyone that has ability to direct shorts or direct a feature, mm -hmm. um, that's something that is, is, coming very quickly up the road for me to get done as well. It's on my to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all of these arts come together. Mm -hmm. And when you think about directing a feature, like you think about the, the element that music brings, the sound brings into it and the photography brings into it and the writing. So all of this, the, so film is such a collaboration of all of these beautiful arts mm -hmm. in one. Yeah. I, what a journey. And, you know, I just wonder what feeling you get when you see one of your students uh, in a production or excelling. What, what do you feel? What do I you cry feel? like a baby. Like I cry like a mother hen. <laughs> I just had a client. Um, I've been working with him. He was in, in a sitcom and I've been working with him and brushing up his, his dramatic skills. And um, we've been just doing audition after audition for about two years. And he just, he called me a couple nights ago and he said, I got the part. And I just wept mm -hmm. with happiness for him because, you know, these actors, we work hard. Yeah. You have to put a lot of auditions on tape before you get that big break. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge movie. It's, it's going to be a, an incredible opportunity for him. Um, and that character playing uh, opposite of him is, is already a celebrity. So it's going to be an incredible opportunity for him. Um, and like I said, you put in a decade of work to become an overnight success. And that's what these kids do. And sometimes it comes quicker. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's, sometimes I get clients that are already on shows that don't have the training mm -hmm. and that's a lot of stress mm -hmm. because they, they're, they have to struggle to keep up. Mm -hmm. So they may have gotten the business opportunity before they did the creative work, mm -hmm. right. Before they were ready. Um, so I work with them and that's, that's a harried process because we've got to pick what do you, what's going to make you better for the, your taping tomorrow? Like, right. So how are we going to get you through this, this, this next scene and make yeah. you feel confident? Mm. Um, so everybody's journey in acting is very, very different. Yes. And that's what makes the business side of acting confusing to most actors and, and frustrating potentially, mm -hmm. because they can look at their fellow actor who just got a part on an NBC show after they've been in class for two weeks, you know, and they've been in class for 10 years, but it's tenacity, it's tenacity. And it's in everybody gets their shot at some point. You just have to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. I believe in hard work. You know, I, everybody that I have seen succeed over the years works very, mm -hmm. real, work very hard and it's very difficult. And what's also interesting is once they get the part, the actors that I know that I've helped performance prep, mm -hmm. You, so you've prepped to get the part. Now you have the part. Now the real work begins. Mm -hmm. Now the real investigation begins and the real collaboration and understanding and listening and research begins. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a full-time job. And mm -hmm. trust me, they're getting up at four in the morning to go to the makeup trailers. They're not, you know, they think yeah, people think actors work is easy and they get big money, but they deserve it. I have to tell you, <laughs> they deserve it. It's, it's a lot of work. It is indeed. I just finished an interview with another very good friend of 20 plus, 30 years actually, um, Kelly Jill Mentor. She was in Mask with Cher 
and she did a lot of TV work. It's a cliche, but that that statement, you know, rejection is God's protection. Oh, yes. It's kind of interesting, right? Very if good. you look at the universe as what will be will be and what's mm. meant to be will happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it is true. And the, and the business is a bit crazy that way. And I have had clients that, you know, 14 year old clients that get roles overnight and then we just prep them and it's magical, right? So I, I, I always try to, I always try to liken it to, to music as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You know, some musicians just, just intuitively mm -hmm. fall mm -hmm. into a piece mm -hmm. or a style, mm -hmm. but I want to say, and not just because I'm a, I'm a teacher, but I want to say that if you want to do a wide variety of mm -hmm. roles, if mm -hmm. you want to expand mm -hmm. and challenge yourself, that's when craft co becomes essential, right? When you are on a, on a, a journey of like your friend said being yourself mm -hmm. that's a different experience mm -hmm. so it's a different kind of um it's a different way to play your instrument if mm -hmm. that makes sense yes right? absolutely mm, right it does indeed you know in some ways i would think you're a bit of a celebrity so you you work with a lot of celebrities but people will know you as well so um, depending on because you've worked in different, as you've explained here with different people at different times. So do you ever have to deal with some of what celebrities deal with, you know, um, people talking or uh, people recommending you or people saying, you know, I mean, you know, with social media as well happening. I'm referring to some of your Instagram posts as well just different things. Have you ever had to deal with uh, any of that external stuff? I hold my cards pretty close to my chest mm. and I, and I don't, ex I, my, my classes are so private. I usually, I'm, I'm, I always protect myself mm. in that the actors that come to me are usually referred by a manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually will know that manager and I research people mm -hmm. or, or say for, from this show, like I will, I trust you and I understand mm -hmm. the dynamics of this audience, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't really advertise. Mm -hmm. So I don't have that issue. And I do that on purpose mm. because I, mm -hmm. I feel that the, for me, it's quality, not quantity. Yes. And so I, because this is how I spend my life the energy exchange mm. with the people that I work with are so, is so essential. Um, I do know a lot of acting teachers that are a little more kind of, they're more branded mm. and they kind of, they, they put themselves out there more. I don't do that. Um, I, I have been tempted to do that because I think that's where the world is going now, especially with social media, you know, you create this persona and you've got, I've got pictures like I'm in real estate, mm. you know, on, on, on bus benches going up and down Hollywood. Just kidding. I would never do that. But, you know, I, so I, I haven't had a negative experience with that, whatever celebrity I have, it's mm. all been positive, thankfully, Excellent. but I'm sure that once you go out into the, the wide, crazy public, it would probably potentially serve me in a, in a crazy way, mm. because that's just how the public reacts to people. Like the, somebody would have to say something like, Oh, you know, who does she think she is or whatever? I don't know. Like, I don't even know. Right. Yeah. But I think, I think that's one thing that, at, that as people that are able to invest themselves creatively, mm -hmm. um, have to overcome yes. is the criticism mm -hmm. of people that don't know you or think that right. they know you. Yes. So, which is what, why I'm bringing it up because you, your business is about people who are quite vulnerable in many ways. They're right. putting themselves in very vulnerable positions. They're being open to embodying other people that takes a lot of empathy and openness um, and then they're faced with what we have today is a huge big judgmental world where everybody has an opinion and mm -hmm. you know in our day I sound like I'm 191 years old but in our day there was no social media and you know, if you thought something about someone, you had to tell them if you wanted them to know, you had to physically walk up to them. You could, you know, otherwise nobody would know. Right, right. <laughs> well, there was gossip. There was gossip, that's, that's for sure. That, but, you know, it's, it's, it is it is a different, it's a different, it's a, it's a cutting edge now. And yes. it is, it's, you know, I do, I do feel for my celebrity clients that are on, I was just talking about it yesterday with, with, with someone close to me about, you know, up on Instagram, you know, yes. and, and 
you know, some, some celebrities choose to do it and some don't. Yes. Um, and I, I, you know, I have to say that I, I, I hope, I hope that the good outweighs the bad enough yes. that it's worth Definitely. advertising yourself. Excellent. I guess that's all you can say, right? Exactly. So thank you. So we've come to the end. So we're going to put a fork in it. Far out random question. I put a cue on the end. So I've got a I little, love this. A little that's bowl so funny. Here. Um, and I'm just going to pick one. Uh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> this is random. What do you think people pretend to like when they really don't? <laughs> oh, their partner's food. Oh, <laughs> They know they've just been slaving in the kitchen and they put down the sacred blessing of gift of food and maybe it's not quite exactly what they want, but they eat it anyway out of love. That's hilarious. Yes, absolutely. Right? <laughs> that plate of food, they were, it was slaved over in the kitchen. Absolutely. My friend, I am so proud of you, everything you have done in your life. We go back a long, long way. Uh, and I'm just so happy that we're still in touch here. Um, and I wish you all the success in the world, what you're doing, how you're helping the actors out there, uh, how you have put yourself forward in that vulnerable position as well to sort of be a mother hen as such for these people who are taking up this profession. So for that, I salute you. I'm so proud of the work you're doing. Keep doing it. Congratulations for 25 years. Thank you so much. Joe. And thank you for what you work. do for, for human spirit and mind and emotion. You are a solid, beautiful being. And I'm, and I'm honored to know you. And I'm so grateful that you me asked too. me to come here today because I loved sharing with you this heart-based business. It's mm, really, it's it really beautiful. Good and I know that. It. Yeah. And I know that you get it. And I know that you're there and that you've done that depth work as well. So yes. thank you. Thank you. All the success in the world. Uh, viewers, listeners, I'm going to put all of Natalie Ford's uh, details, social media, go and follow her. It'll be all in the show notes. Uh, contact her if you want to know more about how to join her, her classes, her school, which are made, her classes are amazing. So Thank you once again. I wish you all the best. Sending lots of love as always. Thank and you, Shaw. I will see you soon. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, love. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.